Welcome. We're going to be talking about depression and DNT, default network training today. Uh, depression is one is the world's leading cause of disability. It affects about one out of five individuals during their lifetime. Uh, as we all know, in unipolar depression, I uh, deal with low mood, exhaustion, feeling of emptiness. And it's often a response to stress, especially if it's um, the stress is just ongoing, constant, with nothing. We get what's called learned helplessness. There was a study years ago where they had a, uh, they used to study um, things, what they called, uh, studying how animals react to stressors. And one of the ways they would electrify a grid floor, they would electrify this floor, and they used to do a study with dogs where they would uh, have the dog food in one section and where there was an electrified floor and the, another section where there wasn't this grid. And they would start shock, turn on that electric grid uh, when even when they put food out there and the dog would shock and would go away, go back to where it wasn't electrified. And they would just keep doing this practice of shocking the animal whenever it got near the food that eventually just stayed over in the other side where there wasn't food. And then they turn on, when they turn off the electrification, the animal wouldn't move over there. They didn't know. It just had what's called learned helplessness. And often learned helplessness is a good um, model of depression. We just feel like things are not going to change. And because they don't change, we start conserving resources. One of the sign of mental illness or mental problems is uh, conserving resources. We just feel like we can't expand. Okay. And in depression in particular, we, get, we can get into this feedback loop where we spiral downwards or collapse inwards. And we may have some predispositions, some biological causes that uh, predispose us to this to depression. But when we then start acting depressed, we don't, we're not fun to be around. Our friends don't want to be near us. We can also look to substances, often depressants, to deal with our mood uh, or to elevate it temporarily. And with this, we get um, not being fun or being uh, overly involved in, in drinking drugs and so forth. We lead to social rejection, which means we have more problems, which leads to further depression, and that's the spiraling uh, feedback loop. All right, so how do we break the loop? Well, we detect it in the brain. Boy, the brain habits have been locked in immature habits, is the best way to say it. And we can identify those overreactive areas. Typically, um, there is sometimes occasionally underreactive areas that cause you problems, but mostly it's usually it's overreactive, overreactive to the environment. Think of it that we have this goal-directed cognition where we do our, we try to seek our goals, what we want in our life, and then we have the environment and how much we let the environment in to thwart, that, lets us, that thwarts our goals or interferes with our plans that can become the source of our depression and uh, other problems. Well, there's many ways to look at the uh, brain habits um, or the result of brain habits, the structures of the brain. Some of these maps are structural. We look at the functional ones, the EEG, which is the least expensive, most portable. You can record EEG almost anywhere. Um, though we do it in our office, but I have recorded it in the back of the car. I recorded it from a friend skydiving. We recorded it in planes. So you can record EEG anywhere. fMRI, which is the more expensive one. Um, also with fMRI, you have to be laying down. So it's not really your natural state. You can't be sitting up. EEG, you sitting up, that's another advantage. Okay, so the lifetime prevalence rate, that's off the screen, uh, for depression, you can see that's one in five, approximately, almost getting to 20%. Uh, for one individual, Hispanic and blood gets lower, but you can see there's also other di disorders coming, creeping in. That's very common. Uh, they say about one in uh, four individuals suffer from some form of mental uh, health, mental compromise state. Okay, so how do you treat depression? Well, you can talk, try to talk your way out of it. The problem is you're trying to change your brain or change your habits with your words or your thinking. And that's not very easy to do. Um, usually there may be some temporary relief, get some kind of cathartic response from a session or so. It may help you sometimes, but often you're still locked in your bad habits. You've got to get all these bad habits, maladaptive habits. One way is to break them is with drugs. 
Uh, the other problem with drugs is that you're breaking the habit from letting something come in from the outside, which is itself sort of a bad habit. You're not training yourself. You're not teaching yourself. It'd be like when you're trying to, if you're trying to play baseball and you're trying to be a pitcher and every time you want some, some great batter comes to, to the plate and you decide, okay, instead of me pitching to the person, I'm going to get my big brother to, or big sister to pitch to him. You pull, pull them in and have them pitch and they struck him out. Struck him out. Oh, great. It worked. That person's always able to be, that challenge is always, uh, solve but you never solve it you saw you let the outside world solve it for you and that because of that you don't even learn how to get out of that problem and that's one of the issues with drugs ect having you shock the brain um they learned years ago from observations that some uh very depressed people who, who happen to be epileptic when they went through a seizure would have their mood raised and so they realized hey let's go ahead and induce the seizure well um problem with inducing seizures you can have mem you'll have memory loss around the seizure and sometimes eventually much more prolonged memory problems. Well, with neurofeedback, it's been around for almost, I think, 50 years now. Uh, we're approaching 50 years. And um, though we haven't always known what to do, there's been some very simple techniques for much of that history. But in the last 10 years, we've been doing default network training. And it's, it's more of a journey. You're going to be training the brain out of its habits and you provide feedback to the clinician so that you can tell them how your state is so in case you happen most of the time we're training people in this towards this positive towards the light in a way towards a way of of releasing these bad habits um, but if for some reason things go awry you can always go the other direction the great thing you know feedback it has this flexibility uh, that the other techniques do not have okay just to show you the reliability we we do do default network training based on the brain map you're looking at a, a, a loop of six brain maps of, um, of an individual doing eye, three eyes closed conditions resting and three eyes open resting conditions where you're just looking at a painting. And you can see how similar those, those, the, each map is to each other. Now, not all EEG parameters are like this. In fact, it's usually the opposite where EEG is very sensitive to moment to moment changes. But this parameter we'll called theta unity is a very good measure of the habit, how our brain, the very circuitry, the loops that we always have in our head. Um, in this map, we don't want, we want green. Green is the balance point. We don't want an orange, that's the worst color. And blue could be an issue. Blue's like where the mind is going in essence, you see in the uh, unaverage all the time. And it actually results in a reduction of connectivity in that area. Um, okay. All right, so there's a saying that Freud started that said anatomy is destiny in, in his works, and it was a sort of pejorative and in some ways negative, but really the best way to think about it in terms of neuroanatomy is anatomy is ongoing. Uh, we're constantly changing how our brain is organized based on what's around us, what our needs are. And the best way to, to get out of depression is from someone to help you in some respect, and eventually yourself to help you. And we heal through empathy and, and affect synchrony, uh, other people being joining our affect. Whenever people's affect is different from our own, it often causes confusion and even anger and frustration. And the empathy and the ability for affect synchrony, that's all uh, organized uh, in the default network. And that's one reason why we call the same default network training is we focus on default network. Um, default network is the best way to look at it is this blue, it doesn't, doesn't show all the areas, but this blue area shows two of the major hubs of the default networks. There's some out here on the wings, which they're not showing because of this view is a, a, a sagittal view. Um, and uh, so this is a general summary of the functions of the areas. And you can see depression being linked to this, to the default network and empathy right down there. You can see um, it, that example is there, mentalizing attention, other things are being done in default network. And we have found known for the default network now for, I think it's almost 20 years now, maybe 19 years, 18 years when people started studying with all this, they spent billions of dollars in, in functional MRI and very little was came out of it. The first thing that came out of a functional MRI that we didn't already know because of lesion studies uh, from the past or, or the neuroimaging we had from the past, including EEG, was that the cerebellum was really evolving cognition. That was the first thing. And the next thing they realized is this default network, that there's certain areas that are not, not next to each other, like distal neighborhoods that coordinate a little bit with each other. 
Um, just like mom and dad, in a way. They're around each other. They coordinate with each other. And I like to call the, the back one the maternal one for many reasons and the front one the paternal one. Um, and you can see this lack of coordination is there in a healthy brain. And this is what I call the wings. This is like symbols and what I call shields, uh, some other things, memories in here. Memory, especially in the, in the double part. This is the, the parietal wing. Okay, so that's coordinated. But in the, uh, here's the schizophrenic uh, individuals. And you see the loss of coordination, in essence, they lost their paternal element. Sometimes the coordination is too strong in some conditions, and that actually is shown to be a risk for psychosis. We see it in the EEG as a marker of depression and uh, anxiety. Here's an example of too much coordination or too much activation in the, uh, in the paternal uh, areas. Uh, that deals with social fairness is one of the ways of describing what happens in this paternal hub. It's, it's evaluating the value of a stimulus. For instance, if you're very thirsty, a glass of water is much more valuable than when you're not. Um, that's done in this area called the ventral pref uh, medial prefrontal cortex, area nine. And um, you also see um, generally some social fairness is finalized there. Okay. So um, this is the uh, early um, image of how they show the default network, these areas distal neighborhoods or hubs that are coordinating with each other and not coordinate with other areas. We have other neighborhoods that deal with tasks, processing tasks. These are the default network they found out deal with what you call auto-relating, relating to oneself, uh, thinking about one's past or imagining one's future. Um, and we can, we can alter that with default network training. By doing operant conditioning, we can target those areas uh, inexpensively with the uh, EEG compared to the fMRI, and fMRI is more expensive, um, be able to alter those habits. And this is all done, we have learned through our 30 years of experience of dealing with the brain, to really think about the brain as a two-story house, where the first floor is built very early. You, you're, you come out of the womb and it's not even done, the first floor is not even done, but some of it's done. And that's the, the subcortex and what's shown here in yellow and even the white areas here. Um, the white areas are actually the ones that are gonna be done, uh, be, be done first and during one's lifetime. But then the yellow areas are getting kicked in, getting coordinated, getting uh, myelinated. Um, and this is the, generally you can call it the limbic system or subcortex. You get the upper brain stem or the brain stem, you got the cerebellum, and then you got the, the, the limbic system. Um, and what we know is that, uh, from, you know this from like baby's speech development, that we start off in what's called relational thinkers. And that's when we're letting the subcortex is, is dominate our cognition. And we go from being relational thinkers to object thinkers. Uh, relational thinkers think everything's about them. I use this little schematic down here, how everything's about you. You have a thought, you have some bad thought, you look at mom, oh no, she's gonna punish me because I had a bad thought, thinking that she, everyone is aware of what you, are experiencing. Everything's about you. And eventually you realize, wait, things are not about, everything's not about me. That's when the neocortex is, not, is coming in. And the neocortex has got 10 times more real estate, 10 times more uh, neurons to process the subtleties of what's in, going on in the world. And you find out what's going on in the world. Most things are dealing with their needs, their own goals, and they're independent of us. They're objects, in essence, uh, from us. They're, they're not part, we're not part of them. And um, so we go from this relational thinking to some level of object thinking, but we want to find a balance because we do alter the world. So there is some need to still have relational thinking, the people we, we interact with in our, in our household, in our uh, at job, in our school. We, we, have, um, we alter the, our environment to some degree. So there's going to be some need for relational thinking. We can't think everything's independent. Um, we walk into a room, not any things are now relating to us sometimes, and that's not everything's independent, depending on what's going on. So we want to, got to find a balance point between that relational and object thinking. And just to give you an example of relational thinking, I like using dogs because they're a great example where they like bark at cars, try to stop cars. They think uh, a horn is honking at them. They bark back thinking that the horn is meant for them. That idea that something's meant for you, that's relational, thinking everything's about you. And we have to get to a balance point where we realize – you know, other creatures, other people, um, that's why I'm talking to dogs, are not, um, uh, other people are, 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 exist for their own needs and not our own. And here's an example of a balance point. Okay, uh, we back in a moment to continue our discussion.